Raymond Merrill was in love and not regular love, not, you know, sit on the couch, been married to my wife for 20 years and we're comfortable together and we've, you know, become one human being, you know, that kind of love you're in after a long-term relationship. No, Raymond was an exciting love, enthralling love. It, it was that type of love that you can feel in the pit of your stomach and it feels familiar. It feels accepting. It feels important and you must follow it. Sometimes when we're feeling like this, you know, we can really put other people on a pedestal and, you know, ignore all of their bad traits and just only look at, oh my God, like you're going to save me. You are going to save me from this experience of feeling unloved and unaccepted. I will follow you into the dark. That kind of love. He was getting a lot older. He had been married, but this time was different. And Regina loved him just as much as he loved her. It had only been two weeks. But like I said, something was different. He could feel it and he had to be with her. I say he had to be with her because they had never met before either. It was an online relationship. Well, a lot of people meet online, but the problem with it is, is that when we meet online, we can hide parts of ourselves, right? People love to only show the best parts of themselves. This was right before they were due to be married. Raymond said, with each breath that I take, I love you more and more. I have more kisses for you than there are stars in the sky. And Regina responded, I have more kisses and affection to give you than all of the little drops of rain that stay on your window for an entire dark night. The little drops have the sunlight's most beautiful color. That's how my love is for you. Oh, he had never had anyone speak to him like this. So beautifully, so poetically, so enticingly in love. He had to have her. He had to meet her. That's the other thing about online relationships. It doesn't matter if someone's hiding something or if you feel like there's still a few red flags along the way. When you fall into one of these, you want to meet them so badly. You want to have that moment where you're finally holding them in your arms, touching them and knowing, oh my God, this is correct. This is who I've been waiting for my whole life. If he could just get to the other side of the world and hold Regina, he would know that this was real. Guys, it's another week, another Monday, and of course, another episode of Sinister. If you plan on being here week over week and you want to help support the podcast, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you leave a like, leave a comment, whatever it may be. And if you're listening on Apple or Spotify or any of the audio platforms, give us five stars. We're brand new and it helps so, so much. Each week I handpick these cases and they're important to me for different reasons. So if you're new here, pardon me if I get a little fired up or you notice me getting a little angry or charged in the episode. It's only because I usually pick stories that I can connect with in some way and I get a little frustrated, okay? This show is not scripted. We do the research. I understand the case. I've picked it myself and then I just dive in. Whatever emotions come out, come out. Listen, I'm an emotional person. It is what it is. Thanks for staying. Thanks for listening. This is Sinister. Raymond, or Ray, James Merrill, was born March 27th in 1950. He was born in San Francisco and he had one older sister named Marcia. Marcia is a very, very important person in the story because one, she's Raymond's older sister, and two, she runs a Facebook page that's still pretty active and up to date on all things involving the case to this day, looking for justice for her brother. Now, it can be a little enraging, but I think it just shows the character of how much she cared about her brother. Marcia talks quite a bit about her brother, and it kind of seems like they had a little bit of a sibling rivalry earlier, you know, little brother, like way older sister. She's about four years older but when he turned 15 and she was 19 they actually started kind of like connecting on some things Raymond he loved art he loved creative things like it was not abnormal for him to pick up a drawing pad and just start doodling or painting or something it seems like he just liked to express himself creatively I also think this is really interesting because like a kid that's like 10 years old that's just like you know making music or uh, drawing a lot of stuff or writing poetry or something. They have a lot of feelings and they are expressing them through creativity. Raymond didn't really stay on the art train for too long because when he was 16, his sister, Marsha, got him an electric guitar. He was already getting a little interested in music, but he needed an instrument to learn how to play and she bought him one. 
and he starts playing it. It starts getting pretty good. Now, something to note here is girls really liked Raymond at this point. They thought he was attractive. You know, some people said that he kind of looked like John Lennon. This was in the 1960s, and one thing that was going on back then was Beatle mania, okay? Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome the Beatles! You guys know, girls were throwing themselves at the Beatles. Like, it was crazy. If you're not familiar with how influential the Beatles were back then, it was just a wild time. And around this time, A, you look like one of the most famous guys ever. B, that style is just in right now. Girls think it's attractive. And then C, he's playing the guitar. Like, I mean, rock stars were just in. He had no problem with girls. In fact, at one point, Marsha actually took him to the last Beatles show live concert in 1966 in San Francisco. And she said the girls were all over him. They were hooting and hollering. They were screaming. They thought he was attractive. All through his early years, he kind of took it easy, played guitar, and he tried to make it in the recording business. It didn't quite work out. And ultimately, he became a carpenter. So in the late 1970s, Ray ends up meeting this woman named Alicia. They met in San Francisco, but she was actually from Argentina. She was from Buenos Aires. And ultimately, he was like, dude, I am so down to move to South America. I'm in. Let's go. Now, I don't know if this was a turning point for Ray or if this was just the way things had always been, but it was pretty well known by friends and family of Ray that he likes Latin women. He did. You will hear over the course of the story, if he meets a hot Latin chick, he is all in on it. <laughs> it was just what he liked. So he ends up moving down to Argentina and this guy is living his dream. He's doing a little bit of carpentry, but he's also playing a lot of shows with a little band that he formed, doing rock music, blues music, whatnot, all throughout Argentina. And that was their life together. Until 10 years later, they were both looking to get divorced. Now, by all accounts, they say everything ended pretty amicably, but I'm like, man, 10 years? Feels like something might have happened, but maybe they just got bored, they had eyes somewhere else. You never know. They broke up. And Ray decided to move back to the United States. And this time he went to Las Vegas to move in with a new girlfriend named Barbara. One thing I noticed when I was looking through this case and all the timelines is that Ray does not like to be alone. He can't be alone for more than a couple months. He's very codependent. So he dives right into this new relationship with Barbara. And Barbara actually speaks quite highly of him um, later on in a show called Web of Lies on Discovery where they interviewed her. And she says, well, he could be a little arrogant at times, but for the most part, he was very generous. He took fantastic care of me. He had a sharp sense of humor about him. And he was just overall fun to be around. She looks back on their relationship pretty fondly, it seems. One thing that I really like about Ray that Barbara said was he had a period where he really, really struggled with drinking, drugs, smoking, all of that stuff. And man, when you're living in Las Vegas, it's hard because there's nothing to do except drink and smoke. But he had really, really worked on himself and saw that this is causing issues in his life. He went to Alcoholics Anonymous. He would have periods where he was pretty sober for a while. And look, that's something that I really respect because sometimes People can see how much their substance abuse is hurting the people around them and they don't do anything at all. And Ray was trying. And not only was he trying, he was doing. And Barbara saw that and appreciated it so, so much. But on the downside, Ray did have his insecurities that never quite left him. And he would have some periods of time where he would just get really reclusive and not really talk to anyone, not Barbara, not a sister, nobody. Ultimately, because of the highs and lows and, you know, not always knowing what to expect when they were getting older, Barbara wanted to end the relationship and Ray reluctantly agreed. So this guy has had two long-term relationships spanning almost like 10 years. I mean, 
you can't say he wasn't trying. You can't say he was a bad guy. He, you know, he's not over here on his ninth divorce after three months in each relationship. No, Ray was trying. He was doing. He wanted true love. He wanted somebody that was going to accept his highs and lows and just kind of ride through it all with him. So right after he and Barbara break up, he gets into another relationship almost immediately. And this new girlfriend, he's really trying to wow her. He had actually come into some money after his mother passed away and he had a pretty large inheritance. Now, all of his friends said that he was the type where if they had invited Ray out for drinks, they had to buy the beers. Or if he was grocery shopping, he would be extremely frugal. But when a new lady comes around, He's got to play all of his cards. He would spend a couple hundred dollars. He would spend a couple thousand dollars. Money was no object when it came to women that he liked. After he and Barbara break up, um, he ends up leaving Nevada and going back to California. He sells his house. He's got even more money in his pocket and goes back home to San Bruno. Now, San Bruno is just south of San Francisco, where the story kind of originated. But... Ray also still has a girlfriend in Las Vegas. So he was planning to move, selling his house, ending his relationship, but he still hopped right into another relationship when he was in Las Vegas, moves away, and then regularly takes a 10-hour drive to go see his girl in Vegas. And he's buying her gifts. He's taking her out to dinners. He's he's doing whatever, you know? He probably wants her to come back to California now that he's all settled in. And she's not really feeling it. She likes the gifts. She thinks he's cute. She likes the attention. But she ends up ending the relationship. And it was absolutely devastating to him. Now, look, if you're like me, you've probably had that friend before that jumps in and out of relationships like crazy. They can't be by themselves for more than a couple of days, and they've always got to latch on to a new person, whether they're good or bad. It probably drives you nuts because you wish that your friend would just learn to be by themselves for a while. Or maybe if it's you, you wish you could learn to be by yourself for a couple weeks, a couple months. But Ray just couldn't do it. And honestly, I kind of get it because he's in his 50s now at this point and he's looking for somebody to settle down with. He's not in his 20s anymore where he can afford to take a year away from dating and find himself even more as a man. No, he's got money. He's lived a good life. He wants to share the rest of it with somebody else and he wants to be in love. Another thing that I think is interesting is that Ray would often talk to his friends and his sister about finding true love or finding the right one. He really believed that it was out there for him. I just also find this interesting because guys don't normally have conversations like this. They don't open up like this to close friends or family. It just doesn't happen too often. But this was really important to him. This was all he thought about. He would often talk to Marsha about leaving the U.S., going back to South America, taking all of his money, and finding someone to settle down with for the rest of his life. Like, he was just dreaming about this. He would talk to his friend Bill about pure love, real love. He had this fantasy that there was a perfect person for him somewhere and everything would just fall into place automatically. And he was determined to find her. So only a few weeks after his relationship ended with the other girlfriend in Las Vegas, he decides to sign up for an online dating site. Over the past hundred years, people would take out personal ads in the newspaper for dating. That was one way that people would find suitors. But then with the invention of the internet in 1990, people could just post their little personal ads online. Every day, America Online is making it a little easier for people to live, work, and play. And then, you know, later in the 90s, they made dating sites. Match.com appeared. There was lots of Christian dating sites. Anything you wanted, you could find a dating site in the late 90s and early 2000s. But they did not meet at a bar or a club or through friends. They met through a service called Match.com. Now, back in 2005, online dating was... 
not quite taboo, but people didn't really understand it. You know, they were like, oh, how do you know who you're talking to really is who they say they are? You know, there was no verification. We didn't have webcams. They didn't make catfish yet. We didn't know, but we were willing to give it a shot. Raymond sets out to make his online dating profile. And, you know, he talks a little bit about himself. He says his height, his age, puts up a couple photos of himself, says that he loves music, he loves to play the guitar, he likes to have a good time. And he also mentioned that he had a lot of money. When Raymond would date girls, the way that he would flatter them was by buying them gifts. He felt like the money that he earned, as well as the inheritance that he gained, was an extension of himself, and that's what he could provide in the relationship. So he wanted to present that first. On Raymond's profile, it specifically said that he was wealthy. He saves his profile, and he fires it off into the internet. And it's a little disappointing because nobody reaches out. <laughs> Days go by. Nobody's clicking on his profile. Nobody's connecting with him. Nobody's matching. A week goes by and he's like, oh my God, like, is this site dead? Am I ugly? How does this work? He, he's getting no matches, no bites at all. But finally, two weeks later, he does get a match. And it's from a beautiful woman in Brazil named Regina. Regina Rashid was a 41-year-old woman who was recently divorced living in Brazil, and she was beautiful. Now, she's quite a bit younger than Ray, I would say by like 15 years or so, but you know, she's over 40, she's recently divorced. He feels like they have enough similar experiences that they can connect. She lives in a small home with her daughter, who happens to speak English, as well as her son, and for work, she says that she runs a Botox clinic out of her home. Now, I want to remind you what state of mind Raymond was in when he met Regina. He felt like he had just been left by his wife, and then he was dumped by his girlfriend in Las Vegas after spending thousands of dollars on her. He was lonely, he was depressed, he was getting older, and this thing that he had been fixated on for over 30 years, true love, hadn't come yet. But it had to be out there with nobody responding to his post, but just Regina, just this beautiful woman, like she was a light in the dark. He felt connected. He felt like it must be a sign. And he was determined to make it work. So Ray and Regina start exchanging dozens to hundreds of messages per day. They're also sending photos to each other, super risque photos coming from Regina. There's these very poetic and sweet messages coming in. But let me remind you, Regina is from Brazil. She speaks a little bit of English, but it's not great. Ray is a guy from the United States who literally speaks no Portuguese. In Brazil, they speak Portuguese. However, Regina had a daughter that spoke English pretty well. So I know this is so weird. The daughter was the translator between them. In between these risque messages, the love letters, uh, photos, I don't know. The daughter was in between it all translating. But they didn't care. They were in love. Regina seemed well to do. I mean, other than the Botox clinic that she was running out of her home. She told him that, you know, she came from an upper middle class family, that they had real estate, but, you know, she was just trying to find her own way in life. And one day, Regina sends him this really steamy picture. I didn't see this, guys. I read the description about it, okay? In, like, the file. I read the description. It said that her you know, like pant was like unbuttoned and she was topless like just holding you know holding her breasts up and she sends him this like super steamy glamorous photo and that night ray said i gotta get over there i gotta see her so he starts talking to his sister about this and he's like i've got to meet her she's the one she loves me this is it oh marcia i've been talking to you about this for years and years and years like this is the one and, you know, Marsha really wants her brother to find love, but it had been two weeks. And he's talking about going to Brazil to go meet this random woman that, quite frankly, no one was even sure was real. Was Regina, who she said she was, nobody knows. But Marsha just can't convince him out of this. Like I said, it 
is that type of exciting love where you ignore all the red flags and you just go with your gut and you follow it all the way. One thing that I want to mention about gut feelings is some of us have really, really good gut feelings. Sometimes we just trust what our body says about a situation. But I want to remind you that when we have those strong feelings in our gut, the gut doesn't necessarily tell you this is good or this is bad. The gut just says, whoa. <laughs> and listen, that's my experience. Take it with a grain of salt. But yes, in my experience, a lot of times when I feel that feeling in me, when I really tap into it, I don't know if it's good or if it's bad. I just know I got to follow it. I, I got to go this way or, or I'm having some kind of reaction to it, right? By all accounts, Ray had to go. He felt like he had to go. He had to explore what was on the other side of this feeling and nobody could stop him. After only two weeks, he purchased an $800 ticket to fly to Brazil the very next day to meet Regina Rashid. Raymond was supposed to come back in just seven days. The whole point of this was to get over there, see if she was real, see if there was a connection, and he was supposed to come home. Nobody hears too much from him in the first week, but by the second week, he ends up calling his friend Bill, and he's like, Bill, I need you to water my plants and take care of my house. She's amazing, and I want to stay another week. And Bill had been his friend for 30 years and he was one of the people that he was talking to before opening up about needing this true love, about finding it, having this connection. And Bill says, okay, man, I got you. Because it was true. Regina was real. She was the woman in the pictures and they met up and they had a good time. I mean, the day that he touched down, he went to her house. He met her daughter who was real and spoke English. He met her son who was real and lived in the home and he met Regina and she looked exactly like her photos. He thought she was smoking hot and every single night they were going out and having a good time. They were going to bars, they were drinking, they were dancing, they were listening to music. It was everything he wanted. It was the connection that he was hoping for. But things were a little bit different um, than he thought they were going to be. I mean, Regina was sending him these like super steamy, hot pictures of herself. But when he got to Brazil, she told him that she didn't want to be intimate too early. Um, and she wanted to preserve herself a bit longer. So he could spend the night there, but he'd have to spend the night in another room. And Ray was completely respectful of this. He was like, I understand love takes time. And I will prove to you that I'm not just here to have intercourse with you and then leave. He said, I love you. I want to be with you. They're having a great week. They extend it another week. You know, he talks to his sister. He talks to Bill. And everyone says, um... Okay, like if everything sounds good. And he's like, okay, oh, well, wait, there is one other thing that I don't love. Um, she said that she kind of has another boyfriend. And, and that's okay because he was in the picture before me. And like, you know, we're kind of figuring things out. But I think she, she loves me. And everyone else is like, okay, well, we'll see what happens. Well, why don't you come on home? So after spending two weeks in Brazil with his new girlfriend, Regina Rashid, he returns to the United States. When he left, Regina was a little cold to him though. And when he got back home, the conversation wasn't exactly the same. And, you know, he's spiraling. He can't lose this. This is his big love. So he asks her, what's going on? Did I do something? Does she not like me? I thought everything went great. And she opens up to him and tells him, I'm really struggling for money right now. My daughter and my son and I, we really need help. And he says, okay, okay. Anything to get that connection back, that spark back, anything you need. He's like, I, I've got you. I, I've got cash. I'll send you money. I'll send you gifts. He's right back into his old habits. Now, he had kind of put a little bit of a stop to it after his girlfriend in Las Vegas, he was buying all these lavish gifts for, and it did nothing. So he didn't start off that way with Regina. But when she raised the alarm that she needed money, he was at attention. And so there's no record of what he sent her in the week after he left Brazil. But what I do know is seven days after he left, he got his credit card statement. And on his credit card statement, there was over $8,000 of charges in Brazil that he claimed he didn't make. So he calls the credit card company and says, hey, 
these are fraudulent. You need to take them off. And they tell him, you know, were you not in Brazil? Because that's an easy way to say that it was not him spending the money. He was not physically present. Somebody spoofed his number. And he's like, well, I was in Brazil, but I flew back. Here's my return flight. Why are these charges on here? And it was a little bit baffling. So, you know, they opened up the investigation and he's saying, take this stuff off my card. I'm not paying it. Also, something else to note is that this is in 2005 and it's also happening in Brazil where the dollar stretches a little bit further. And this is 20 years ago. So when we consider inflation, $8,000, that could have been $12,000, $15,000, $20,000 in modern time. That's a lot of money. Ray ends up calling his sister, Marsha, and he's like, you're not going to believe this. You know, I was down in Brazil and somehow somebody spoofed my credit card number and they spent all this money. And Marsha's like, you went to visit this woman. She was real. But then money went missing from your account. Ray just didn't want to believe that she was involved in this somehow. It had to have been a mistake. He's still talking to her every day and telling people about her. He actually told his neighbor, a woman named Eva Quinones, about how wonderful his time in Brazil was and how in love they were. And he even told Eva he was thinking about buying Regina a car. Eva is just now hearing about this woman. She's known Ray for a while. This is kind of crazy. She even talked about it later where she said she walked in on him when he was struggling with all the bills on the table, you know, calling the credit card companies, trying to get this taken care of. And when she asked him about it, he said, oh, it'll get sorted. It's not a big deal. The conversations between Regina and Ray continued. His first trip was in November 2005. And then by January 2006, he was already planning another trip. This time, the trip would be a little bit different. Once again, Raymond flew out, headed over to Brazil. But this time, he didn't stay with Regina. He actually stayed in a motel because she had told him before that she was talking to other men. And something that she said must have freaked him out because he didn't want to be in the house. But it seems like Regina would regularly talk about her seeing other men because at one point, Ray enters the conversation again about buying her a car. She's telling him she desperately needs a car. You can't walk anywhere in the town that she's in. She has to have a car to get around, to get supplies, to do things for her children. And of course, he's got the money. Now, Ray, after his life savings and inheritance, had hundreds of thousands of dollars. So if Regina needs a car, you know, $10,000, he says, okay. But the car wasn't $10,000. The one that she wanted was more expensive. It was twenty or $30,000. And when he told her, well, hold on, baby, I thought you just needed a car. You just need to get from A to Z. Because that's what I'm thinking. Like, if I don't have a car and I need to go somewhere, I'm good on the Honda Civic, okay? She didn't want the Honda Civic. She wanted the Lexus. That was not the exact car. There was a different brand in Brazil. But just so you guys kind of understand the scale of how it would be if you're, you know, in America. She said she wanted a $20,000 SUV. And also, she needed $10,000 to help legalize her Botox clinic. Her at-home Botox clinic. Honestly, he's probably like, God damn, $30,000? I just met you like four months ago. But she pulls out the card she uses all the time. She says, actually, um, I don't need any help because my other boyfriend's going to help me. Which is just crazy in retrospect. Because it's like, you got another man that just has $30,000 lying around? Well, remember, Ray's money is part of his ego. It's part of the value that he thinks he brings to a relationship with a woman. So hearing that another man has even close to the same amount of money he has and would be willing to give it away and help her, he says, no, forget that guy. Never mind. I'll, I'll have the money to you tomorrow. Let's go buy the car. And Regina gets exactly what she wants. She gets the $10,000 to legalize her clinic. She gets the $20,000 SUV. He also helps pay for her daughter's tuition. He pays for groceries. He pays for household items, anything and everything. He's bending over backwards for Regina. And we're only about four months in. Raymond cannot stop talking about Regina to everyone close to him in his life. It was very concerning when Bill and Marsha heard that he had bought her a car. And he even kind of joked like lovingly about like how spoiled she was. He thought it was kind of cute that, you know, she had to have the best. He kind of liked that about her. But other people, and rightfully so, saw it as a red flag. Bill was especially concerned because he had always known Raymond to spend money on the women, 
but he was pretty frugal when it came to other things. He wanted to be able to live a long, sustainable life. And the other thing that really freaked him out was they still hadn't been intimate in the relationship. So he's, you know, spending upwards of $50,000 on cars, travel, groceries, tuition, anything, everything. And they haven't even hooked up yet. And Bill's like, this is a major red flag. But Ray just wants to be respectful. Once again, the trip was only supposed to be a week, but Raymond extends it another week. He's having a blast with Regina, going to bars, going to dinners, just sitting together on the couch, hanging out. Yeah, he was sleeping in another room, but he really enjoyed his time with her. But after two weeks, the honeymoon is over and he returns home to another $20,000 missing from his bank account. Last time it was $8,000, and now it's $20,000. $20,000 of charges all throughout Brazil coming straight out of his Citibank account. The charges upset him greatly, but he channeled his anger more to the banks and the credit card companies rather than Regina. She was the love of his life, and there was no way that she was involved. He even sent her a message at one point saying, I'm tired of thinking about banks and cards and whatnot. I just want to think about you. That's all he cared about. And Regina said, and I just want to think about you. Now, about five or six months after their first meeting, he decides, one, I want to see her again. Two, I'm going to do a little detective work on these credit card charges so that I can get this fixed and then also tell everyone in my family what's going on and it was never her. And three, he pocketed a $5,000 engagement ring so that he could marry Regina. On March 21st, Raymond left again for Brazil for his third trip where he and Regina were to be wed. Bill saw him off at the airport and the last thing that he said to him was, Bill, it's showtime. He was going to Brazil to go get his woman and he planned to live there and spend the rest of his life with Regina and her kids. When he arrived, he popped the question to Regina immediately and she says yes. And then she says that they should get married on March 27th, which happens to be his 56th birthday. So the proposal and the flight happened on the 21st and they were to be wed just six days later. It was a little bit of a longer trip. He was supposed to return on April 4th, but this time he didn't. Now, this wasn't too abnormal because normally he would extend his trips and he would call Bill and he'd say, Bill, I'm having a great time. Water the plants. But this time there was nothing. No emails, no calls, no nothing. Well, even though other friends and family like Eva, Bill and Marsha, they all felt a little uneasy about Regina. They knew she was a real person. They knew that he liked her. They didn't like he was sending a lot of money, but... It was probably fine. The red flags came when Marsha started reaching out a lot and letting Raymond know that their father was passing away. Raymond and his dad did not get along for much of his early life, but later on, they kind of reconciled and at least had an understanding of each other. It would be very strange if Raymond didn't go see his father as he was dying. So Marsha is sending email after email saying, you know, he's really not well. He's really not well. He wants to see you. You should come. No calls, no messages, no nothing. But he was an adult and he had flown out several times before. It wasn't until May 2nd when Marsha and Raymond's father, uh, Eugene Merrill, he was 86 years old, he passed away. And when she sent another email to let him know about his passing, there was still nothing. And this is when she definitely knew something was wrong. So on May 8th, 2006, just about six days after their father passed away, Marsha officially marks him as missing. Immediately, the police, the FBI, the consulate in Brazil are all over it. And the first thing they see, thousands to tens of thousands of dollars just flowing out of Raymond's account. Now, she had warned the authorities that this woman was asking for a lot of money from her brother, but here they can see it in real time. Thousands of dollars just getting drained nonstop. Of course, they're going to try to follow the money. That's what makes the most sense. But because Marsha had tipped them off and said that there was the woman that was kind of the centerpiece of this whole situation that she did not trust, they had to go talk to her. So they head out there and they ask Regina, you know, what happened to Raymond? When was the last time you saw him? What is going on? And she says, oh, 
I haven't seen him since April because last I heard, he was going to go visit this other woman somewhere like north in Brazil. And they're like, okay. So they go and talk to that lady who was a real person, by the way. And she says, well, yeah, he was supposed to, you know, come by and say hi, but he never came. So Regina was the last person to see Raymond. Now, the report was filed on May 8th, and over the course of a couple days, they continued to watch the money. As they're looking into everything, they see that just between February 2nd and May 12th, there was over $132,000 missing from the account. This does not include the $20,000 SUV or the $10,000 earlier. That is not even in the equation. This is just the money that was spent in Brazil over the course of those couple of months. At this point, the bill is just racking up way too high. They've got to freeze the cards. They've got to close the accounts. After May 12th, there were no more transfers that could be made. But not even two weeks later, on May 24th, the branch officials got a grammatically incorrect message that was very, very strange. They claimed to be Raymond Merrill, and it was a different email account than what he usually used, but it was a Hotmail account. It's like Raymond Merrill one at Hotmail.com. And they reached out and they said, I am Raymond Merrill. I ask you to reactivate my card right away, all capital letters. In the email, they also demanded respect from the authorities because his father had just passed away and he also asked for $50,000. The authorities see this email and they think this is absolutely insane. It's not Raymond. It's got to be somebody else. But now the light bulb flickers on and it's like, okay, yeah, this is all about money and something fishy is going on here. The authorities suspect foul play. I mean, it's blatantly obvious at this point, but they had no physical evidence. They have no witnesses. They have no body. They don't have a case. Investigators start to lose steam and friends and family start to lose hope because they feel like they don't have any more leads. But shockingly, the next lead comes only one month later. In June, a black market currency dealer says that he was contacted by a woman that wanted euros and USD. The black market currency dealer agreed to meet with her in a parking lot and she came with another man. While they were in the car, the guy says that the man and woman attacked him and tried to steal the money. Now, they were in his car. He's a dealer, you know? They get in the dealer's car, they act like nothing's going on, then get out. Well, when they attacked him, somehow he manages to get away and they hop out of the car, run into a different vehicle and leave. But they left a handbag. Inside of that handbag was Regina Rashid's identification. And next to her identification was the Citibank card for Raymond Merrill, the same exact one that all the money was coming out of and had been being used for the past couple of months. Of course, Regina Rashid was arrested that day. But when the police go inside of her house, there's something that they didn't expect. Regina had renovated the entire home. Fresh paint on the walls, wallpaper in every bathroom, new floors, clean carpets, everything was redone. And this wasn't just for her Botox studio that she definitely was not licensed for out of her home. She had done her daughter's room. She had bought her daughter a new $20,000 car. All the money was right there. It was right there in the home. Another thing that was inside of the home that she definitely didn't need were sedatives. These are sedatives that will completely knock you out. The other thing is, she's a scammer and a con artist. These were forged prescriptions. Even though Regina claims that she didn't do anything wrong and Raymond had given her the credit cards, which literally nobody believes, the investigators start to piece together a picture. They believe that Regina and some type of partner had used the sedatives to drug Raymond and keep him out of it for a couple of days while they extorted banking information, passwords, anything that they needed to access the account. And ultimately, when they were done with him, they think that they disposed of him. Now, of course, Regina didn't do all of this herself. She'd been talking about the boyfriend since she met Raymond. So now the investigators have to find the boyfriend. His name is Nelson. Nelson was kind of a small time scammer. He had been convicted of fraud before in the past, but he's nowhere to be found. They ask around, nobody's seen him. Regina's like, oh, I don't know where he is. So they decide, well, this whole thing started online. 
let's see if we can go online to find Nelson. So they use a popular social media site in Brazil that's called Orchid. And lo and behold, there he is. They find this guy's profile, and this is the corniest profile ever. This thing says, like, that he loves rock and roll, booze, and women. And the other thing about it is he has all of these pictures where he was recently just at a beach resort. And not just any beach resort. It's the beach resort where Raymond Merrill's card had been used last. Nelson was partying, drinking, having fun, posting all of these pictures on social media. So they take that photo of Nelson and then they bring it to the currency dealer that had filed the report. They show him the picture and they say, is this the guy that tried to rob you that night? And the dealer says, yes, that's him. And he points to the picture, but he's not pointing at Nelson. He's not pointing at the guy that's Regina's boyfriend. He's pointing at another man in the picture. But he is so sure that this was him, 100%. Well, who's the guy in the picture? It's a guy named Evandro. An officer actually said this about him. They said that he was a small-time loser with a long history of drug use and petty crime. But just like Nelson, Evandro is nowhere to be found. But they're on the case and they know exactly who they're looking for. I got to tell you, the way that uh, stuff surfaces in this case is just, it's very citizen's arrest. So Evandro was out at some kind of beachside bar, hanging out, talking to the bartender. And I mean, look, if the police describe him as a loser, I don't think other people in the town thought too highly of him, especially if he was scamming everyone around him. Well, he's talking to the bartender and he says... I killed a gringo. And the bartender's like, okay, well, you want another drink or you want your tab? Like, what's up, you know? And after he talks to Evandro, he goes, you know, and places an anonymous call. And he's like, hey, this guy's saying that he killed someone. Come and pick him up. And they do. And it's Evandro, the guy that they've been looking for this whole time. So they pull Evandro into the interrogation room and they tell him, okay, here's the deal. They said, look, here's the deal. You know us, the police, because he gets arrested all the time. They're like, you know us, we know you, but there's one other factor in this case. We got a lady in the room that says you did something real bad and she's telling everything. So what do you want to say to us? Whew. And the investigators said that Evandro opened up like a faucet. He just started spilling everything. Here's the deal. He claims that he was not involved in the murder at all. He knows it happened. He knows who Raymond is. He knows Regina. He knows Nelson. But he said he didn't put any hands on anybody. He only put his hand on a body because they told him that for $6,000, they needed help disposing of the body. And that was supposed to be his job. Now, of course, we don't know how true that is because anytime these people get into the interrogation room after a murder that they plan together, what do they do? They all start pointing fingers at each other. I really don't even know if Regina was actually in the other room, but Evandro started confessing right away. But he claims he never touched the body. According to Evandro, they rented a car on April 1st. And when he arrived, Raymond was already dead. He claims that they took the body into the car and put him in the passenger seat. And they drove out to an abandoned road 25 miles away. And just on the side of the road, they took him out, left his body there, and they lit him on fire. And this was true. Because on April 2nd, the authorities did report that a charred body had been found with a copper wire around their neck. Over the course of a couple of days, they had drugged him, kidnapped him, extorted information from him. And after three days, they strangled him with a wire and took his body out to the side of the road and set him on fire. The dental records were able to confirm that it was indeed Raymond Merrill. During the investigation, a lot more dark stuff started to come out. I, I mean, Raymond had kind of been protecting his love, Regina, from the judgment of friends and family. But when they looked at the communications between the two of them, Regina was a dark, I'm sorry, cold-hearted bitch. She was sending emails to different people, for example, a photographer, where she told him that she wanted some sexy photos. And she said verbatim, don't worry about the money. My American will pay for it. That's how she saw him, as just a means for more money. There was also emails from her daughter, Anna, where she was talking to Raymond and speaking on behalf of her mother. And she would say, please, please help. My mother is, ha she's on the verge of having a heart attack from how financially stressed she is. And of course, he's sending them money. He wants love. 
And this is what she's saying he needs. So he's going to do it. He would try to explain how much he loved her and cared about her. And she would send him messages back like, love doesn't pay the bills. Love doesn't take me to the supermarket. Love like this doesn't give me peace. And Raymond, I need peace. I need money. And he would open his wallet and he would send whatever she needed. Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. But it was never enough for her because the love was not real. She was a true con artist, not only a love con artist that had a boyfriend and was siphoning close to a quarter of a million dollars from a man in America, but also her Botox clinic, she would perform surgeries on people. She would call it medical tattooing for eyebrows and makeup on the face, and she would even perform liposuction on people inside of her home. I think part of her renovation was to show people, look, I'm legit. I make money with what I do because I'm so good at it. She would even take out ads for herself claiming that she was some amazing surgeon or doctor. She even passed herself off as a doctor by forging prescriptions for other people. She was trying to get some kind of respect in the community, but Everyone knew what she was up to. Throughout this investigation, new things were turning up every day. And of course, Regina was arrested. But the next parts of the story are pretty difficult. And this is exactly why I said earlier that Marsha still advocates for her brother. Nelson, the boyfriend, was arrested. But unfortunately, it was October 2006. And there is a Brazilian law that says no one can be arrested in the days immediately before and after an election. He was like, oh, they lost track of him, but they did later find him. And Regina, she decided she wanted to fight back. She actually sold her SUV for $20,000 so she could afford the legal fees and get herself out of jail. And it kind of worked. You guys are going to lose your mind over this part. Look, even though this all happened between 2005 and 2006, this did not go to trial until 2021. Prosecutors were able to retell a pretty airtight case, and Regina was given 30 years in prison, but that didn't hold up. She used her money and her legal team to basically get her out of jail one year later in March of 2022. Then she appealed her sentence and got a lower sentence down to 20 years. Nelson and Evandro were exonerated because of the statue of limitations. Yes, I know it's a murder case, but apparently in Brazil, there were still a statue of limitations and they were exonerated. Now, here's the funny thing. When Regina got her sentence reduced to 20 years, part of that said that she had to return to prison by a certain date. Otherwise, she would be a fugitive. Regina never returned. She didn't call in and she went on the run. However, somebody else did call in. Another anonymous tipster called in on August 5th, 2023. In fact, Marcia actually posted this on the Facebook page thanking whoever the anonymous tipster was. After they called it in, they found Regina and arrested her again. Now, unfortunately, Marcia posts updates and she actually believes that because of the Brazilian legal system, she will not serve her full sentence. Might only serve a third of it maybe five or six more years. During her time out of prison, she continued to scam people. She has multiple victims all throughout Brazil, and she doesn't care. If they let her out in the next six years, she'll get right back to exactly what she was doing before, stealing money from innocent people that are either looking to love themselves or looking for love. 